say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing bad. You stood on this stage night after night, reminding me. All right. We're glad you're here this morning. If you would, let's stand together and sing Because He Lives. Stand with us.
Father God, you are holy, and we praise you this morning. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the wonderful and awesome work on the cross that Jesus has done for us. Lord, we lift you up, and in all that we do, Lord, we ask that, Lord, you be praised. And, Lord, we pray that you just draw us closer and closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Morning, we get to celebrate with Miss Claire Andrews, if I can come on in. Um, Claire comes, she got saved a few years ago. She, she came to faith in Christ um, a few years ago, but hasn't followed through in believer's baptism. And she came forward recently just professing a desire to follow the obedience, follow through in obedience with Christ's command to baptize. baptize. And so that's what we're doing this morning. She knows it doesn't save. She knows it's just a declaration to the world of what Christ has done to her and forgiving her of her sins. And so, Claire, it's my responsibility to ask you, who is Lord of your life? Jesus. Amen. It's upon that profession of faith that I can baptize you in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Good job. Hey, let me go ahead and welcome you today to our services. Thank you for coming, and thank you for being here. Uh, it's hard to believe that Easter's just right around the corner next week. And so uh, next week we'll have three services, 8 o'clock, 9, 15, 10, 45. Uh, next Sunday, uh, you know, normally we'll have probably next Sunday anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 on our church campus. So parking's going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, walking around may be a little bit more difficult. You know, there are always folks who can take the attitude of, man, what are all these people coming to my church on Easter and messing it up for? Uh, well, that, that's kind of why we're here. Uh, we, we hope it's filled with all kinds of folks that only come on Easter. Uh, because more importantly than us getting them to show up every Sunday, we want to introduce them to Jesus Christ and let him do a change on the inside. Uh, but uh, next Sunday, we're asking our deacons, we're asking Sunday school teachers, those in leadership, to park over at Highland Park Elementary School. Uh, they'll be running a shuttle over there, but the reality is it's not that far of a walk. Uh, go ahead and walk it and enjoy the beautiful creation that God has given us. Now, if Easter is like last Easter, then, um, you know, wear your rain boots. And uh, the walk will even be more adventurous as you make it over here. But we always try to leave that parking that's closest to the building, guest parking, available to those that are guests. So uh, you could help us out with that next Sunday. Some of you guys are going to be bringing folks with you. And uh, you say, does that mean I get to park in guest parking? No, that means that you drop them off at the door and you go park at Highland Park Elementary School. Um, but please do, invite them to come with you next Sunday. But here's what I love about uh, being a follower of Christ Jesus. We don't have to wait to Resurrection Sunday to praise his name and to worship him for who he is and for what he has done. Because the reality is, as a Christ follower, every day is Easter Sunday. Because we, as followers of Christ, benefit the fact that the tomb is empty, death and hell have been defeated, and there is glorious life for those that are in Jesus Christ. If you're visiting with us today, again, thank you for being here. We'd like to know a little bit more about you, and we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our church. The way that we can accomplish that is if you look at the chair back in front of you, you'll see a pocket. Inside that pocket, there'll be a little bitty card. Fill that out for us. You can drop it in the offering bucket as it's passed to the end of the service. Or the reality is as soon as the service is over, what we would prefer is you come out to our welcome center out there um, and bring that card. We will give you information about our church. Uh, you'll get a free gift for uh, bringing that card out there, um, just kind of a way that we try to entice you to get your information so we can tell you more about our church, put you on mailing list and stuff like that, okay? Do that before you leave today. Again, you will never, ever, ever know when you will need a good alibi. So you want to document the fact that you were here today should we ever have to testify in a court of law on your behalf, okay? All right, let's stand to our feet today. Turn to the person next to you and say, do you need an alibi? No, no let's don't do that. Just welcome them today as we worship together. Would you do that?
You can be seated. crazy. <laughs> my girls may not remember this. When my girls were little, they used to say, hold you. Hold you. They would walk up, hold their arms up, and say, hold you, daddy, hold you. And what they meant was, I want you to hold me. Uh, hold you. Maybe your kids did that as well. I was thinking of that as I was hearing them sing that song. And I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful to know today that as a Christ follower, we have a Father in heaven who is willing to hold us, even in the most difficult times, uh, when life doesn't seem to make sense, and uh, we may even say that it's malfunctioning just a little bit. He is there safely guiding. He is there lovingly holding us. Um, a few years ago, I took my family to Disney World. And uh, at Disney World, um, I went on a ride with my kids. 
And uh, if you've ever taken your kids to Disney World, you've probably been on this ride as well. The ride is, it's a small world after all. And the reason why I remember that is because it goes around and around and around and around. And basically, it's all these small people, these children from all these different countries and different cultures. And they're all dressed in different clothing, yet they're all singing the very same song. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, small world. <laughs> and so the first time around, it's okay. And the second time around, it's tolerable. And the third time around, it's just getting on your nerves. And the fourth time around, you're like, okay, I'm going to jump in the water and swim back. Because it's literally driving me crazy. But you know, stop and think about life. Life will do that sometimes. Life, life really is a small world. And sometimes life makes no sense. Sometimes it's kind of like what we said uh, earlier. Sometimes it's like you've got a big out of order sign hanging around your neck when it comes to your life. I mean, have you ever found your life to be so full of dysfunction and pain that you feel like that sign should be around you as you just go about your everyday business? Because we expect life to function in order, don't we? I mean, we kind of have this delusion about us that, hey, if I do the right thing, then I can expect the right results, but life's not that way. There are some of you guys here today, husband or wife, and you did everything that you knew how to do the right way when it came to that marriage, and still yet he or she walked out. Man, that's out of order. There are some of you parents here today, and you raised your child in the ways of the Lord. You did everything right, and then they still made wrong decisions. That's out of order. You were a faithful employee. You worked with all you had, you gave it your hardest, and yet they still laid you off. That's out of order, isn't it? You ate healthy, you exercised regularly, you took all the vitamins that the doctor told you to take, and then some, and yet you still received a bad health diagnosis. It's out of order. What in the world is going on? It seems as though, I don't know about you, but it seems about me that sometimes I look around and it's like good folks are the ones that are suffering and it seems as though those that are living wickedly and those that are living evilly are actually the ones that are kind of getting a pass. And yet God tells us in his word that we can do everything right. And yet we still have to deal with suffering in this world. But here's what I love. He tells us how to deal with that. He tells us, here's how you respond when you find yourself living in a life that is malfunctioning, a life that has that big sign, if this life is out of order. And he gives us that over in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles today, open them up. Verses 13 through 17. If you'll remember, if you've been here for any time as we've been walking through this book, 1 Peter in the New Testament, he's been telling us over and over that for the Christ follower, this world is not our home. Don't find your hope in the things of this world. Don't exhaust yourself on the things of this world. No, you were created for beyond this world. You were created for relationship with God the Father. So find your hope in him and not in the temporary things. Look at how he tells us to respond when life seems out of order, when it seems as though we are filled with, uh, you know, dysfunction and pain. Now, I want to remind you this. I say this all the time. I just want you to know this very clearly. You can sit there, and you can take the four things that we're going to talk about today, and you can follow it to the T in your life, and it doesn't mean that your life is going to be void of suffering. You can follow these four things that I'm going to share with you exactly to the letter, and yet you're like, well, I still don't find any hope. I still don't find any peace in the midst of this pain. No, friend, these are things that are birthed out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That apart from Christ, you're never going to find what you're longing for. 
Apart from Christ, life's never going to make sense. Apart from Christ, that peace that we all longingly desire is never going to be ours. So understand, Peter is saying that those that are in Christ Jesus, those that have surrendered their faith and trust in him, when life doesn't make sense, here's how you respond. Look what he says in verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 3. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ, they may be ashamed." For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. See, the problem is we expect life to be fair. Yet it didn't take me living very long to realize life is not fair. And while we find ourselves living in a world and living a life that is not fair, it does still not change the fact that God is good. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is gracious. And so Peter is saying that for those who have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when life malfunctions, respond in one of these four ways. First of all, talk about your hope. Talk about your hope. Look in verse 15 again. He says in 15, always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, did you know today that if you're here and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've got something that the world desperately needs? Hope. Hope. See, the English word for hope was not strong enough. So the biblical word that is used here for hope is the, uh, in the original language, it's the word elpis. Not elvis, but elpis. Here's what it means. It means something that is built upon truth. See, our word hope many times is attached to dreams. Like we talk about our hopes and our dreams. For instance, I could say this in our language. I could say that I hope before I die, I get to see the University of Tennessee win another national championship in football. That's a dream. Probably not going to happen. But I can hope, can I? I can dream. Nobody has promised me that, well, the coach actually did, but he's been a liar for about five years now. <laughs> Nobody has promised me with surety that that's going to happen, that that's going to take place, that before I leave this earth, I'm going to get to witness that and I'm going to get to see that. But the Bible word here, that word elpis, which means hope, it's actually right the opposite. It's not a dream. It's the truth. It means that I can hope, I can help us in the anticipation that I'm going to receive exactly what has been promised. So understanding the biblical meaning of that word, when I say I hope I go to heaven, I can say I know that I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus said if I will put, put my faith and trust in him, then heaven will be my home when I die. I hope I go to heaven and that's a whole lot different than saying I hope I get to see the University of Tennessee win a national championship in football. Nobody has promised that. Nobody has said, I'll see that. But Jesus has promised that I'll be with him in heaven. And so here's what Peter is saying. Peter is saying that for the child of God, for somebody who knows Jesus, that when you face adversity and when you face suffering, when you face pain, when life makes no sense whatsoever, that you can still maintain hope because you can trust Christ at his word. 2 Corinthians 1.10. Paul talks about this. Look at what Paul says. He says he, and he's talking about Jesus, has delivered us from such deadly perils and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Folks, let's just be honest today. Jesus is the only hope that any of us have. Friend, listen to me. Don't put your hope in people. People will let you down. You put your hope in me, I'm going to let you down. I put my hope in you, you're going to let me down. 
Some of you guys are sitting there and you're putting your hope in our government because there's a new administration. Don't put your hope in our government. Our government will let you down every single time. Don't put your hope in the economy. The economy will let you down. Yesterday, I was with my youngest and we made a stop by the grocery store and all of a sudden, usually when I go to the grocery store, uh, not only do I go with a, a little small list that's going to be a quick stop, but all of a sudden, I start getting texts from other folks that live in my house. Get this, Dad. Get that, Dad. Stephen, don't forget about this. And, you know, and so we're there, and we're walking through, and I've got pictures of a recipe that my daughter sent me, and I'm having to scroll through that to the text and everything else. And what was going to be a quick stop turned into an hour and 30-minute stop. And there are only so many cookies they'll hand out at the deli free of charge. <laughs> and so me and my youngest were walking down the soda aisle. And he's like, ooh, RC Cola. And nobody in our house really likes RC Cola. He loves it. Ooh, RC Cola. There was an elderly gentleman in our aisle who heard him say that. And he goes, RC Cola. Oh, that brings back some good, you know, all of a sudden he just, he's a storyteller and we're standing there on the aisle. He says, I remember when I used to get an RC Cola in a bottle and Ray's like, dad, that's, shh, be quiet, son. In a bottle and a moon pie for a nickel. And he's like, my son's like, a nickel? For a nickel? Five cents? And he's like, no, what's a moon pie again? You know? And this guy, here's exactly what this guy said. He said, but that's when the economy was good. You can't get anything for a nickel anymore. And he looked at my son and he said, don't put your trust in the economy. And I thought, well, if he don't walk out of here with anything else, he'll walk out of here with that. That was a good word right there. Hey, folks, Jesus is the only hope that we have. That's why we don't put our hope in anything else of this world. It will let you down. Our hope is in Christ. It's not found in ourselves. It's not found in other people. How do I know that I'm going to heaven when I die? How can I hope that I'm going to heaven when I die? Because Jesus promised me that if I, faith, if I put my faith and trust in him, I would not perish, but I would have eternal life. That is hope. That is truth. The reality is there are two issues at stake here. First of all, i got to have hope. Jesus said, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. I'll give you hope. But there's a second issue at stake. He says, be quick to tell everybody where your hope is found. When you find yourself enduring suffering and pain and difficulty, make sure they know when somebody asks you that you're full of hope because of Christ. Here's what he means. That is, Christ followers, when we endure the difficulty, the malfunction of living life in this world, our response to that should be different from someone who doesn't know Christ. That we ought to still find joy in life. That when we respond in a certain way, when people see us smiling in the midst of pain, when people find us refusing to hurl insults at folks who've been talking about us, when people find us responding differently than the world, they're like, my goodness. How can you respond that way? How, how can you still be happy even though you've lost it all? And you're like, oh, I hadn't lost it all. I've still got the most important thing that anyone can have. And that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. So he says, I, I'm going to take care of the hope thing. I'll give you that. Talk about your hope. Make sure they understand why you have hope and even though you find yourself suffering. The problem is too many Christians are like Arctic rivers. We're frozen at the mouth when it comes to talking about our faith. And I know some of you are like, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm afraid I'd say the wrong thing. Next thing you know, they'd be thinking about Jesus and then I'd talk to them and then they're like bound to hell forever. Oh, friend, go ahead and risk it. You ought to live in such a way that causes others to come to you and say, how can the world, can you respond to suffering and pain the way that you are? Well, let me tell you how. I don't find my hope in this world. I find my hope in Jesus. A lot of times we'll sit there and we'll say this, well, I don't want to be an obnoxious Christian. <laughs> 
most of us in this room, there is no threat that we're going to be an obnoxious Christian. But we tend to take it that far, don't we? Well, I don't want to be one of those Christians, you know, you know they're shoving the, thr- the truth down people's throats, and they always want to be talking about Jesus, and they're always, uh, you know, spiritual and things along those lines. Nobody likes an obnoxious Christian because they're so loud. First church I ever pastored, small church, North Mississippi. And I was really challenging the church to make their workplace a mission field. I've done it with you guys as well. Hey, you're going to go somewhere tomorrow, whether it be work, school, wherever the place you you find yourself. And the very reason that you are at that place is because Jesus has placed you there as a missionary. It will revolutionize the way you approach work and school and your neighborhood when you see it as a mission field. And so I was kind of doing that, and there was a guy in our church that was a barber. He was a, a senior adult. It was funny. His name was Moon. He was completely bald, and he was a barber, had his own little barber shop. And so, you know, he came to me after a while, and he said, I found something very interesting. I'll set somebody down in my chair, and I'll put the cape around them, and, uh, you know, I'll start cutting their hair. And all of a sudden, I've got a captive audience. So do you know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior? He said, I've found that they won't walk out of there with half a haircut. And so they have to listen to everything that I say. And so he says, hey, whenever I get a new customer and I've not talked to him about Jesus, that's exactly what I'll do. He came back not long after that and he said, I had an interesting thing happen this past week at work. He said a new customer came in. He sat down. He wanted a haircut and he wanted to shave. You know, and there was a lot of commotion and talk going on in the shop. And so I was talking to somebody else that was there and I was lathering him up. And, you know, and I I went ahead and sharpened the straight razor and I was getting ready to shave him. All of a sudden, it kind of clicked in my mind. I hadn't talked to him about God. And he said, I was getting ready to shave him. All of a sudden, I said, son, let me ask you, are you prepared to meet God? (laughs) He said the guy jumped up out of the chair and ran out of the shop with lather all over his face. I guess he thought he was getting ready to meet God right then and there, right? (laughs) Nobody likes an obnoxious Christian, but that's not what Peter is talking about in this passage of Scripture. Folks, listen to me. Evangelism should not be a telemarketer trying to sell a product. Evangelism is one beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find bread. But we're not talking about bread. We're talking about hope. We're talking about hope. And the very best way for you to share your faith is when someone sees you dealing with the difficulties of life, when someone sees you dealing with disappointment, when somebody sees you dealing with rejection, and your life is different, then all of a sudden they'll come to you. How in the world can you respond the way you're responding? How in the world can you have hope? How in the world can you respond that way? How in the world can you continue going on? I'll tell you how. Jesus. Jesus. Make sure you talk about your faith, about your hope. Secondly, treasure your blessings. Treasure your blessings. Look in verse 14. He says in verse 14, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Here's what he means. That regardless of the circumstances, you always find blessings in your life. Paul wrote about it. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3. Look at the screens. Look at what he said. He said, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, there are some blessings that are in the physical realm, like good health. There are some blessings that are in the relational realm. There are some blessings that are in the material realm. But here he's talking about the heavenly realm. Spiritual blessings. And notice the promise that he gives us there. That if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not that you'll get some of those spiritual blessings. It's not that you'll get most of those spiritual blessings. What does he say right there? He says you'll get every single one of them. That you are blessed as a child of God. That you are blessed as a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I found... That one of the very best ways to treasure your blessings is to substitute the word blessing for lucky. I try my hardest not to say to someone, good luck. I don't believe in luck. Now, you know, when I'm out playing golf and I make a putt, which doesn't happen a whole lot. The guys I'm playing with, they say, man, you sure are lucky today. No, I'm not lucky. I'm blessed. 
Somebody would come up to me and say, man, you sure are lucky to have a wife like Jennifer. No, I'm not lucky. I am blessed. God says it right there, folks, in the black and white. You are blessed if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You may say, well, I sure don't feel very blessed right now. Feelings didn't have anything to do with it. Do you know your feelings are lie to you? Some of you are sitting there right now, I feel cold. You're not cold. It's on your mind. If you're to start telling yourself you're hot, then you'll warm up. For instance, me. I'm sweating like a stuck pig in July. And I'm telling myself it's cold. And it's not working at all. I mean, your feelings will lie to you. You say, well, I don't feel very blessed as a follower of Jesus Christ. The infallible word of God assures you that you are blessed. Do you get that? Say amen and give him glory today. The infallible word of God says that because of Jesus in your life, no matter what suffering may come, no matter what pain may come, no matter how disappointed life may get you, you are blessed. Because of Jesus in your life, every spiritual blessing belongs to you. Not most, but every single one. Have you ever noticed this? We'll go 100 days straight without getting sick. And then all of a sudden, we'll get sick. And we'll say, oh, Lord, why'd you let me get sick? I can't be sick right now. Oh, Lord, I can't believe you're allowing me to go through this. When in reality, we ought to stop and say, well, thank you, Lord, for the 100 days straight of health that you gave me. I'm blessed. You ever noticed, we'll drive a car for 10 years without having a wreck. And then all of a sudden, we'll have an accident and we'll throw up our hands. Oh, Jesus, why have you forsaken me? I can't handle that right now. Lord, why in the world would you allow me to go through this accident when instead we should be saying, thank you, Lord, for all the times you've safely allowed me to arrive at my destination. You're blessed because of Jesus. I was reading a while back about a great Methodist pastor who lived in London. It was the late 20th century. His name was William Sangster. He started having some health problems. He went and had some tests. And after the test, the doctors told him that he had a debilitating disease in which paralysis was gradually going to develop to where eventually he would no longer be able to walk and he would no longer be able to talk. Upon getting the devastating diagnosis, I want you to listen to what the pastor did. Pastor Sangster wrote down four resolutions that were going to guide his life. First of all, he wrote, number one, I will never complain. Number two, he said, I'll keep my home bright. Number three, he said, I'll count my blessings. And number four, he said, I will try to turn it to gain. Up until the very day that he died, he kept that positive attitude. Hundreds of folks came to Jesus Christ because they witnessed the attitude of Pastor Sangster as he dealt with this debilitating disease. On his very last Easter Sunday, No longer able to talk. He wrote a note and he gave it to his daughter. And here's what he wrote on the note. How terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice to shout, he is risen. But far worse than that, to have a voice and not want to shout, he is risen. Treasure your blessings, friend. When life seems to be malfunctioning, when you're like, that's me, out of order sign around my neck, everything is dysfunctioning, everything is painful and suffering, treasure your blessings. Talk about your hope as other folks are seeing you walk through this difficult time. Third, try not to panic. Look in verse 14. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Do you know what I have found? When life doesn't go the way I thought it's supposed to go, I tend to get afraid. You ever do that? When you find yourself doing all the right things and then all of a sudden the results were not supposed to what's supposed to come with the right things, you're like, oh my goodness, what is happening? I am so afraid here. Uh, Peter uses an interesting word there where it talks about troubled. It's translated terror. 25 years ago, the word terror, terrorist didn't really mean a whole lot to us, did it? But after 9-11, we all know that we can be 
affected by terrorism. So here's what Peter's saying. There sure are some scary things in this world, but God's in control. God tells us over and over in Scripture, do not be afraid, do not fear. Matter of fact, I'm not counting it, but I've been told that there are over 365 times in Scripture where God says, do not fear, do not be afraid. That there is one for every single day of the year. Do not be afraid. If you are in Christ, you don't have to fear. Friend, listen to me. I don't need 365. One would be enough for me. You don't have to be afraid when life goes wrong. You don't have to fear when you're dealing with the dysfunctionality of of life and when you've done this good thing and bad things result. You don't have to fear because you are in Christ. Jesus gives us great promises. One of those talking about fears found over in Luke 12, verse 7. Look at the screens. Look at what he says. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. And then he says in verse 7, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Don't be afraid. Can I paraphrase that? Here's the Stephen Kyle paraphrase. Hey, God's still on the throne. Chill out. (laughs) Hey, you didn't see this coming, but it didn't catch him by surprise. It's okay. Take a deep breath and relax. You don't have to be afraid. Isn't it kind of our human nature to automatically fear the worst? That we find ourselves dealing with a situation and automatically we're going to go the farthest distance and, you know, we're going through this difficult time and the enemy will try to sabotage our minds. He'll try to get us to think that things are never going to get any better whatsoever. But friends, listen, we've got to realize that sometimes the painful circumstances that are in our lives, that God will take those and he will use those to produce positive results. His ways are not our ways. We're on this side of glory, and he's on that side of glory. That God even works in suffering to bring about good in our lives. I heard the story about a guy one time who his ship sank. He was shipwrecked on a deserted island, the only one who lived. He crawled up on the beach, and he sat there, and he said, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? Oh, God, please send someone to rescue me. Oh, God, nobody knows where I am. Oh, God, please give me your help. Days and weeks went by. Nothing happened. Finally, he decided that he would walk around the island, and he found some supplies, and he built himself a little hut to kind of get out of the elements. And so one day, he had left that hut, and he was going out, and he was trying to find some food to eat. As he was walking back, the cook fire that he had built to cook the food on caught his hut on fire. His hut was burning to the ground. He sat down, he buried his face in his hands, and he's like, oh God, the only thing I had was this hut, and now you've taken that away from me. Oh God, why would you do this? Oh God, why would you allow this to happen? He fell asleep crying that night over the circumstances. The next morning as he woke up, he was surprised to look out and see a ship that was anchored right there next to that deserted island. As the rescue party made their way to him and they were boarding him on that ship to take him safely home, he said, how in the world did you guys ever find me? No one knew where I was. How did you ever know where I was? Here's what they said. Well, we saw your smoke signal yesterday. (laughs) And that's how we located you. See, guys, sometimes some of the things that we sit there and we get so afraid about and we chalk up as the worst thing in the world that could ever happen, God will sit there and he'll take it and he'll work through it and eventually it'll be the very best thing that could ever happen to us. I want you to stop and think this morning. Ten years ago, ten years ago, what in your life were you most fearful about? Chances are most of us can't even remember that. So whatever fear that is dictating your life right now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write Romans 8.28 above it. 
Romans 8, 28. Whatever that fear is, whatever it is, that anxiety, whatever it is, oh my goodness, I'm afraid this is going to take place. I'm afraid this is what's going to happen. It dictates your life. It's what you think about when you wake up first thing in the morning. It's what you think about right before you go to sleep at night. I want you to write Romans 8, 28 above it. What does Romans 8, 28 say? For we know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. So when life malfunctions, Peter says, hey, talk about your hope. React in such a way that others will say, how in the world are you able to remain positive? Well, let me tell you, I know Jesus. Jesus is good. All life stinks, but my God's good. (laughs) Treasure your blessings. You know, I found that when it comes to blessings, there's always somebody that's got it a whole lot worse than I do. Treasure your blessings. You say, I have no blessings. Oh, if you're in Jesus, you're heir with the king. You got blessings, every one of them. Try not to panic. Take a chill pill. Relax. Write Romans 8, 28 across it. And then finally, you got to trust Jesus as Lord. Trust him as Lord. Look in verse 15 as we finish this morning. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. The key step when your life seems out of order, when it seems to be malfunctioning, is to trust Jesus as Lord. The word Lord there literally means boss. It means master. See, some people want Jesus as their Savior, but they don't want him as their Lord. But friend, listen to me. He can't be Lord or he can't be Savior unless he is Lord. Lord means that he is in control. He is the master of your life. See, there's a lot of folks out there that want a fire insurance policy. There's a lot of folks out there that say, yes, I want forgiveness of my sins, and I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want Jesus, uh, you know, kind of interrupting plans that I have in my own life. Well, the truth is, friend, you cannot accept Jesus as your Savior and willingly reject him as your Lord. See, once you put your your faith and trust in Jesus... Not only do you have eternal life, but you have life in the present. A lot of times we sit there and we think, well, you know, I'm so glad that I'm a follower of Christ because I have an inheritance that's waiting on me when I leave this world. You do. But friend, you've got an inheritance right now. You are in Christ right now. That means That he takes everything in your life and he makes and molds and shapes daily us into the very image that he wants us to be. The image of Jesus. Is Jesus your Lord? Or is he just some policy, insurance policy that you have? No, it doesn't work that way, friend. I love the great story of The little boy who went to his pediatrician and the doctor was there and the doctor was listening to his heart. He could tell the little boy was anxious, a little nervous, and so he was trying to lighten the situation. He said, oh, what's that I hear in there? Do I hear Barney in your heart? And the little boy said, no, sir, Jesus is in my heart. Barney's on my underwear, but Jesus is in my heart. Look at what he says there. He says we're to sanctify Jesus Christ. You know what the word sanctify means? It means something that is so special to you that you treasure it. It's precious to you. Something that is so valuable that you hold tightly to it. Sanctify Jesus As Lord. I grew up in the 70s. And I can remember in the late 70s, I'd ride my bicycle down to Culver's. We called it the grocery store. It was kind of like a superette. There was a there was a laundromat and you could get gas and you know, and they also had groceries and you could also get fishing bait and all that kind of stuff. And I'd ride my bike down to Culver's. I'd usually do two things. I'd buy a sun drop cola. You ever had that? That'll change your life. You need to get one of those. 
and then I'd buy a pack of baseball cards. I'd sit there and I'd open it up, and you know, that's back when they gave you the, the, the stick of gum that was kind of like cardboard. Yeah, yeah, and you would chew it, and you were like, oh, man, I don't know why I'm chewing this. And, and really, really, they just, they said they were giving you gum, but it was kind of cardboard to keep the cards straight. That's what it was. And so I would sit there and I would look through my cards real quick to see who I had. And then all of a sudden I'd walk over to my bike and I would take a clothespin. And I'd pin the baseball cards on the spokes of my tire. Any of y'all do that? That way when I rode my bike, those cards would hit each other and it sounded like a motorcycle. There were times I'd sit there, oh, there's Nolan Ryan. Clip him on my bike tire. Got a few Reggie Jacksons. Yeah, let's clip him on there. Let's go. Never any Cardinals. I would always keep my Cardinals. We know they're the best baseball team out there. I'd ride until those cards would get so beaten up, you couldn't even recognize whose face was on the cards. And then I'd go back and I'd buy me some more. And I'd clip them on there. And I'd ride until you couldn't see who it was. If I only knew then what I know now, I remember, I remember a few years back sitting there and just, you know, kind of going white all over as I was reading an article where a Reggie Jackson baseball card sold for $1,000. If I'd only knew then what I knew now, I would have treasured those as valuable as they truly were. But we didn't really know at that time. Friend, listen to me. Here's what Peter has said. Peter has said that if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you need to realize how precious and how valuable that relationship is. That there is only room for one number one in your life and in your heart, and it must be Jesus. That when you find yourself living a life that is malfunctioning, that is out of order, you've got to understand that Jesus is Lord over your tough circumstances. Matter of fact, here's what Jesus said. He said, Lordship involves a whole lot more than just saying, Lord, Lord. Matter of fact, here's how Jesus said it. It's over in Matthew 7, 21. Look at the screens. We'll be done in just a moment. Jesus said this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then after that in that scripture, he goes on to tell us what's going to happen to those folks who only merely verbalized that he was Lord, but truly didn't have a relationship with him as Lord. Here's what he means. There are some who give lip service. Now, there's a lot of folks that have walked down an aisle of a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church or man, a Methodist church or I don't know whoever has aisles that you can walk down. And they think, yep, I'm right with God. I'll walk down that aisle. I'm right with God. They dunk me up there in that baptistry. I'm right with God. I'm a church member. I'm right with God. There's never a Sunday that goes by that I don't come. I'm right with God. I tithe. And all friend, there's only one thing that makes you right with God. Jesus is your Lord. He says many on that day will say, well, now hang on just a minute, Jesus. There are things that we did in your name. We said, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, y'all, you may have said, Lord, Lord, but I never knew you. Is that you? Where are you putting your hope? Where's your hope? Is it in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Like Jesus, for those of us that know him, the devil will come along and the devil will lie to you. And the devil will say that, you know, your life's out of order. But the reality is those who have Jesus as Lord, your life can't be out of order. And if you believe the lie of the devil, you're not going to have hope. You're not going to have joy. You'll never have peace. And instead, we say to the evil one, we say to Satan exactly what Jesus said. Hey, devil, you're the one who's out of order. Shut your mouth and get behind me. Jesus is my Lord. The greatest resource that we can give to a lost and dying world is hope. Where's your hope? Where's your hope? I don't know about your hope, but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Where's your hope? Where's your hope? Let it be found in Jesus, friends. Would you bow your heads with me today? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, can I first of all talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Those of you that know Jesus is Lord, I'm going to ask everybody to hang, hang with me. Can you hang with me for a while? Hang with me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you know that you know Jesus. You got that settled. You got that done but you're believing the lies of the evil one. Maybe fear is gripping your heart. Fear of the unknown. Or maybe legitimately we'd say, you got every reason to be afraid. Well, not if you know Jesus. Would you trust him? Would you take him and his word? That maybe today you would sit there and quietly in prayer you'd just say, hey Lord, forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for not trusting your promise that in all things, in all things, you'll work it for my good. Do you need to pray that today? There are others of you here that you don't know Jesus is Lord. You've been trying real hard to get everything fixed in your life on your own. I hate to say this, but it's only going to get worse until you finally surrender control to him. That's a terrible thing to say, but that's a great thing to say. Because that's built upon a promise that's found in Jesus, not what this preacher says. That today he longs to have a relationship with you. Today he longs to embrace you. He longs today for you to say, okay, Lord, I give up. I give up. <laughs> I surrender. I give my life to you. Be my Lord. Take it. My trust and my trust alone is found upon you. If that's you, I beg you not to leave this place without responding to Jesus. Please, friend, please. The only hope that any of us have is found in Jesus. Just a moment, we'll stand. And I'm going to ask you guys to hang with us. I know some of you guys, as soon as we do the invitation, you're like, we're out of here. The service is over. No, friend, listen. When we read the Scripture, the Scripture always invites us to respond. It's the reason why we offer an invitation here. I know some churches don't. And, I mean, I'm not trying to say what they're doing is wrong. I'm just saying what we do here. Because the Bible always invites us to respond. And we believe that when we do that publicly, there's a humility that comes. And there's also a rejoicing that comes. And that God gets glory. And so as we stand, some of you guys, you just need to come to one of these pastors and say, you know what? I am ready to follow Jesus. Or you need to come and say, you know what? I'm ready to follow him in baptism. Because while I know him, I've been disobedient in that. Or you know what? I am ready to follow him and be a member of this church. Because that's what he's called me to do. You're welcome to come and pray in this altar on these steps. By yourself or grab someone. Or come to one of these pastors. They'd be happy to pray for you. We had two young ladies, two young moms in the first service that came publicly professing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I got to tell you, friend, they're, they're leaving this church today a lot different than when they came in. That same gift is available to you. Oh, God, accomplish your perfect, perfect will. I pray that your Holy Spirit would walk all around this room right now from row to row, 
from chair to chair, from heart to heart. And that, God, that we would respond as he speaks to us, that you will get glory through it all. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now as our ministers come. And as they lead us in song, friend, you respond as God speaks to your heart. Would you do that today? Do you know walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life. Won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, who then shall I fear? Who then shall I fear? been just so reminded of who he is and who you are in relation to him that that you, you you just don't even really know what to say well that doesn't bode well when you're the guy that's supposed to be doing the talking 
God's good. Whew. Hey, and, and listen, there's some of you here today. Man, he has done a work in your life. And there are others of you here today that, man, right now he's moving and he's working in a powerful way. I've known what it's like to be in a service and the Holy Spirit be moving in my life. And I walk out of that service thinking, well, if I get home, if I get to the restaurant, then, then, then I'll quit having to worry about this. Mm. I've been there. This too shall pass. I don't say this to try to motivate you to make a decision. Please hear my heart. I'm just, I'm just gut level honest. I wonder how many people are in hell today because they said this too shall pass. Could I ask you to bow your heads? They're going to sing this one more time. Not the whole song, guys, just a verse. There are pastors that are still here. Man, we'd love to share with you how you can have peace and hope and how you can have eternity in Jesus. If you need to come, would you come today? If nobody comes, man, we'll continue on. God's good. God's already done a mighty work today. But maybe today you'd be willing to say, no, no, I'm not walking out of here as I've walked out of here many Sundays. Today I'm driving that marker down in the sand. That from this day forward, I know Jesus as my Lord. As y'all pray, Corey, Wayne, as you guys sing. Singing, oh no, you never let go. Through the calm, through the storm, oh no, you never let go. In every high, every low. ask you to bow your heads and ask our ushers to go ahead and get ready. We continue to worship today, giving our tithe and our offering, just financially giving back to God, being faithful in this. Um, and I would just encourage you guys to do that. God has blessed every one of us in this room far beyond, uh, far beyond a dollar. And so uh, be faithful. As a result of your faithful giving and your obedience to him, we are able to take the gospel of Jesus, not only locally, but all the way around the world, okay? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Trey, lead us in our offertory prayer. Our God, we, we do come before you today, God, just giving you praise for who you are, Father, just worshiping your name, Father, for your, your deserving of the worship of every person on the face of this earth. So, Father, as we're 
obedient and giving back to you. Father, may you take that offering. Father, may you take the tithes and offering and use them in a mighty way to spread your name all around this world, Father. So we do ask that you, you bless it. In Jesus' name I pray. A few announcements just to remind you of before you leave today. Again, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll have three services, 8 o'clock, 9, 15, 10, 45. Life groups will meet as they normally do. Uh, so if you're a part of one of those, uh, just that normal time, 9, 15,